Guns for General Washington Chapter 11 Into the Storm On Christmas Eve, Henry Knox got his wish. It finally began to snow. Fat, white flakes fell steadily, blanketing the trails and adorning the branches of the pines. Early Christmas morning, the men rolled out of their warm beds, washed up, ate a quick breakfast, and harnessed the animals. Eager to begin, Henry gave the signal, and the guns crept slowly out of Glen Falls. Just below town, where the Hudson made a loop, the river was solidly frozen. With relief, Will saw that the ice was very thick, thick enough to carry the heavy sleds and carts. The good crust of snow would give traction for the animals. The drivers all made this crossing safely. Then they headed for Saratoga. From there, the colonel hoped to push right on to Albany. The recent snow had been a big help, and the men were in good spirits. At the rear of the column, Henry rode alongside William's sled with its giant 24-pounder. If our luck holds, he said, we'll be right on schedule, little brother. No doubt about it. The general will have his cannon in two more weeks. Will, watching the colonel trot to the front of the line, shook his head and smiled. That's what he liked about Henry. The man was always so cheerful and optimistic, so sure everything would work out. As far as Colonel Knox was concerned, bad luck was something that only happened to other folks. Henry passed the Becker's wagon and gave him a friendly wave. Perched high on his seat, J.P. could see the whole column. Craning his neck, he could even spy Will Knox, whom he admired, bringing up the rear. The drivers in their gray scarves and caps and troopers in their blue tunics, the guns of iron and glowing brass, the sleek muscles of straining horses, the shiny leather harnesses, the brown oxen bending under the wooden yokes. Everything stood out crystal sharp against the dazzling snow. John P. Becker decided he'd never seen a grander sight. When they reached Saratoga, the tired men received a welcome much like the one at Glens Falls. It looked to William as if everyone in town came running to greet them, and in the spirit of Christmas, people brought baskets of food and jugs of ale and cider. The next morning, the men started out again, but as they moved through the Hudson Valley, leaving the Adirondacks behind, their luck changed. Instead of stopping, the snow began to fall more heavily, and slowly their kind helper became an ugly enemy. The temperature dropped, the wind rose, and eight miles below Saratoga, the convoy found itself smack in the middle of a raging storm. Waves of snow fell and a howling wind whipped stinging needles of ice into the faces of men and animals. It piled up giant drifts that blocked the trail. Time after time, Will and the others had to climb down and shovel the drifts away before they could push on. Along with this came bitter, bone-chilling cold. Huddled on the seat, leaning against his father, J.P. thought he would never feel warm again. He'd wrap pieces of burlap over his shoes, but his feet were blocks of ice. His hands were numb in their wool gloves, even tucked inside his coat pockets, and his wide brim hat was yanked so far down over his frozen ears that he couldn't see anything in front of him. Not that there was anything to see through the fierce driving sleet. Henry and Will did their best to keep the convoy moving. Horses and oxen struggled bravely through 10 inches of snow, then 12 inches, then 18 inches. Soon the animals were fighting through snow well over two feet deep. At that point, the solid oxen still tried to move, the horses could not go on. Strain as they would, the snow was simply too thick. In the teeth of this blizzard, the convoy came to a dead halt, and Henry called a conference. We're just north of the town of Stillwater, he said. Some of us will have to get through to the town on foot and bring help. The animals were unhitched and led into a grove of pine trees where they had a little shelter. Most of the men with Will in charge stayed to build fires, guard the wagons, and tend the weary animals. The rest of the party, led by Henry, started hiking. From the grove, William watched the hikers disappear in a blinding whirl of white. 
For the first time during the trip, the young soldier felt a pain of doubt, a nagging feeling that they might fail. He fought the unpleasant feeling, but it kept returning to torment him. Standing there with sleet stinging his face, he began to wonder if their noble train of artillery had finally come to the real end of the line. And we'll read chapter 12 next time. Thanks so much for listening. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Love you guys. Bye-bye.